This is the Barbados Today Afternoon News for Friday, November 24th. Thank you for joining us. I am Mary Claire Williams. The former governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, Dr. Delisle Worrell, is recommending that government makes further cuts to the public service and enter into an agreement with the International Monetary Fund in a bid to revive the economy. Dr. Worrell offered the advice in his latest essay, The Barbados Economy, The Road to Prosperity. And he says that government should seek assistance, should also seek assistance from the IMF in paying off the retrenched public workers. Government's expenditures must be reduced to what taxes will support once the NSRL and foreign exchange fees are removed. That will entail a separation fund for public servants to allow for job reductions of 1,500 persons each year for three years. An affordable scheme would provide each person leaving with about $60,000. In addition, support for state-owned companies would be reduced by 10% a year for three years. Government should seek the support of the IMF and other international financial institutions to fund the separation package and to oversee a comprehensive program of public sector reform. Meanwhile, it appears that the controversial National Social Responsibility Levy is not meeting its targets as anticipated by government. Barbados Today obtained a copy of the draft Barbados Sustainable Recovery Plan of 2017, which was prepared by officials from the Ministry of Finance, following consultations with a social partnership. The document is to be tabled in Parliament next month, and officials suggest that the NSRL is now likely to perform weaker than, likely, than earlier expected. The document also warns that the lower revenue would affect government's overall chances of achieving its fiscal targets. The warning is similar to that from the International Monetary Fund earlier this week in its latest economic assessment of Barbados. It followed the annual Article 4 consultation. The NSRL was increased from 2 to 10 percent on July 1st. And last month, Finance Minister Chris Sinclair told Parliament that the tax had raked in $50 million in the first three months. The Cahill campus of the University of the West Indies is teaming up with health institutions in Cuba in its latest moves to internationalize the institution. The UWI this morning signed two memoranda of understanding with the University of Havana and the Ministry of Health in Havana. Principal Professor Eudine Barito said it will allow for the joint exchange of students and staff, as well as research on issues of regional importance. The MOU with the Ministry of Health in Cuba is of great importance to the Cable campus and to Barbados. Let me just give some examples. It allows for the research of the use of drugs and technologies developed and marketed by BioCuba Pharma. And these would have a considerable impact on public health in Barbados. For example, Hebeprot P, the wound healing drug on the diabetic foot and the research of our Deputy Principal, Professor Clive Landis, in his other capacity within the George Allen uh, Chronic Disease Research Center and many other colleagues have been doing work in this regard. And I know its current director, Professor Lapia Samuels, would be very pleased with this collaboration. The MOU enables specialist patient care for Barbadian citizens in Cuba. It enables accessing mortality data to conduct comparative analyses on social determinants. This is regional and international news after this short break.
Barbados Today, news you can trust. Thank you for staying with us. We're back with news from the region. Investigations in Trinidad after motorists traveling through the Beatum community were met by angry residents who put up roadblocks in the area yesterday. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley addressed the issue at a news conference a short while ago. And we get more from TV6 News in Port of Spain. Residents swarmed onto the roadways, tossing debris and old furniture while commuters were driving by. When Team 6 arrived, the situation had calmed down significantly, but police still had to do multiple traffic diversions to facilitate the clearing of the roads. Some of the residents say that the protests came as a result of neglect by successive governments to tend to the issues plaguing the area. What we need is somebody from the respective representative, the Ministry of Works, to come here and view these canals, because it's not one or it's five canals we have on the beat time like this for years. And look at the cat manpower, we are, we are real manpower all over the beat time, ready to work. This isn't the same story we were told a bit lower down the road. Another resident who preferred to speak off camera explained that the residents were tired of the injustice being hurled their way. They come and beat them and the local people dress like that, but nothing with no, no, no weapons, they no guns, they no nothing. And they just come down here and just the local people just so, and we don't like it. So we decide that how can we go. Senior police officers say that after the arrest of the two suspects earlier in the morning, officers put up a roadblock after which residents shot at them. It was during this situation that residents became enraged and began spilling debris onto the roadways. And on the international scene, South Africa's Supreme Court has increased the former Paralympic champion Oscar Pistorius's jail sentence from 6 to 13 years for the murder of his girlfriend in 2013. The double amputee, known as the Blade Runner, was not in court when the new sentence of 13 years and five months was handed down. The prosecution had appealed the original sentence, saying it was shockingly lenient. The family of his late girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp, was also absent, but welcomed the new punishment, saying it showed that justice can prevail in South Africa. And finally, Zimbabwe's new president, Emerson Manangwal, has laid out his vision to revitalize the country's economy at his swearing-in this morning and also vowed to rule on behalf of all citizens. We get more in this report from Reuters. Zimbabwe has a new president. Emerson Mnangagwa officially sworn in on Friday, bringing the final curtain down on 37 years of rule by Robert Mugabe. Crowds gathering at a stadium in the capital, Harare, for what's seen as a historic inauguration. 93-year-old Mugabe led Zimbabwe from independence in 1980 and was the world's oldest serving head of state. He's citing tiredness as a reason for staying away from Friday's events. Mugabe's rule came to a sudden halt when the military took power just 10 days ago and an ensuing move from parliament to impeach him. Over the course of his rule, he was often accused of human rights abuses and election rigging. Now, the hope is the so-called soft military coup will usher in a new era. Many looking to Munangagwa to clean up politics and turn around Zimbabwe's dysfunctional economy. He's urged Zimbabweans to seek reconciliation, not revenge, and promised to woo international investors. This is the time to comply. The opposition urging him to end the culture of corruption, but the new president has been part of the ruling elite, and some wonder if Zimbabwe is electing a leader cut from the same army-backed autocratic cloth as Mugabe. That's news this afternoon. Remember, there's more on our website, www.barbadostoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, and like us on Facebook. We're on Izumi Media in bus terminals and screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. You can also find us on Mix 96.9 FM. I am Marie-Claire Williams. Good afternoon.